Welcome everyone to uh, Takeover Tuesday today. Thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, being in community as we learn more about our amazing Cadre program. Uh, I want to start off first with an introduction. My name is Erica Jones, a kindergarten teacher in Los Angeles, also a member of the CTA board. I'll be facilitating the conversation this evening. And we want to start off with a land acknowledgement, then we'll get into introductions of everybody else. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional and ancestral territory of the Tongva First Nations on which I am currently uh, participating today, working and organizing. It is important to acknowledge the land because growing up on colonized land, I never heard the, the true traditional names. Indigenous people were talked about in the past tense and all the struggles they faced there were in the past tense as well. It is easier to deny Indigenous people their rights if we historicize their struggles and simply pretend they don't exist. I would like to take this opportunity to commit myself and invite others to the struggle against the systems of oppression that have and continue to dispossess indigenous people of their lands and deny their rights to self-determination, work that is essential to human rights work across the world. A land acknowledgement must be connected to supporting the current work of our First Nations activists in order to move past diversity work and into true equity work. So with that, thank you. I'm going to pass it over and introduce our amazing panelists this evening. And again, thank you all for welcoming. Uh, we, we will be dropping links in the chat, so make sure you have access to the chat, as well as uh, there will be a time leader for Q&A. Uh, but first, before I get into that, uh, why are you here? You're here because you were interested or want to know more about our Cadre program. And basically, it's an amazing program of member-led training. Um, where members are teaching members and or building community with members or getting into difficult discussions with members uh, all around racial and social justice. Uh, it's an amazing program. It's been around for a while, uh, probably decades within, within CTA. I don't know the exact time frame, but probably decades. And uh, we have recently revamped the program and have, a, have an amazing crew of trainers, uh, some of which you will meet tonight. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, our folks to introduce themselves, their role, uh, a little tell us a little bit more about themselves, and we will start with let's go with Vanessa. A little glitchy situation here for a second, but I'm back. Uh, my name is Vanessa Robinson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a fifth grade teacher in Greenfield, California. That's in Monterey County. Um, and the, are we going straight into why we joined Cadre? Yeah, okay. So um, when I heard of this cadre training program, I knew I immediately wanted to be a part of it. Um, I guess what led me up to wanting to do this work at this level with CTA and training other members and getting the message out there at this um, amplified pace is that uh, it, it starts with a like a why that my superintendent or my mentor had who I followed. And it was that as educators, we really are in the business of saving lives. Um, in multiple ways, right? Um, we talk about a lot here in our communities about how it ends the cycle of poverty that happens in a lot of our students' homes. But since 2020, you know, like three prominent names have been on my mind, Aubrey, or Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. And I constantly think about how, had you know, the McGregory's or um, Chauvin had been taught socially accurate information or racially accurate accurate information in their in their courses or in their schools maybe the narrative they had about these people would have been different and their lives may have been spared and so when we think about what we do every day as educators yes we're here to educate but what does that really mean to me it means truth and speaking truth um teaching truth and allowing not only for our students to go out into the world and be um, productive members of community, but also to like safeguard themselves. So a lot, I teach in a predominantly Latino community and I think it's important for them to understand even the narratives written about them or said about themselves and help them kind of think of ways they can rewrite their own narratives and, and, and have some power or agency over um, themselves in community. And I think that that also can only be done if our educators are willing to give all of our students that space in the classrooms as well. So um, here to do the work, love doing the work, uh, and I'm honored to do it with these folks here on this panel also. 
Thank you. Let's uh, go ahead over to Scott. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm C. Scott Miller, and I teach fifth grade in Orange County. And I have been part of the cadre now for, as Erica says, decades. Uh, the second, probably the second go around, um, I joined as a cadre trainer um, way back when CTA had Breaking the Silence, which was a good training for the time. But that was a long time ago, and we've We've um, evolved a lot since that time, but the reason why I decided to join the cadre back then and to continue now is because I wish my educators and my lives when I went to school had the training that we provide now. And um, that would have made a world of difference uh, for me and for a lot of other um, LGBTQ plus students. Um, we weren't really into, uh, we were more, more the, L and the G back then, but um, we now have, we know that we have many different identities, many different types of children and their struggles are real and they're often ignored and pushed to the side. And um, I have made it my own personal goal um, to help people become aware of the things that they don't quite get because many of our, um, trainings, whether you went into the classroom, you're a counselor, many of our trainings don't ever touch on social justice issues and especially LGBTQ plus issues. And there's there's already a deficit when we start and we walk into a school building where children are being bullied, harassed, and oftentimes by other staff members. So one thing that I really want to make sure that we do is that everybody is knows what they, people already know the difference between right and wrong. And we often don't uplift those people when there's something that's wrong and support them. So that's something that I really want to make sure that we do through the LGBTQ plus uh, trainings, plus I know all the other ones as well, is to help empower people to stand up and take on the fight um, locally right in their classroom or counseling office or bus or wherever they might be. Awesome, thank you. I'm gonna hand it over to Cassie. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Cassie Talbot, uh, pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm a middle school, high school, social studies and Spanish teacher in the Bay Area in San Mateo County. Um, and my light just turned off, <laughs> so I'll keep going. Um, I'm also a Western States uh, toolkit trainer and I'm a doctoral candidate at San Francisco State University for educational leadership. And I wanted to be a human rights cadre trainer because um, I wanted to challenge myself to unlearn um, all that I had been taught about uh, to believe in people in the system of education um, and contribute to the lived experiences as educators in the fight for liberation. This was, I teach in the same town that I grew up in and racial justice, equity, LGBTQIA+, BIPOC leadership, none of that was ever talked about and uh, I was never challenged. So moving about the world as a cisgendered, heterosexual, white female, uh, I just took, it took up so much space, <laughs> it took up, said things that were so inconsiderate. And it was, uh, I felt my job uh, and a pleasure to do so is to be back into the teach, into the teaching field and to teach in my hometown in a way that none of the educators that I had taught. And I wanna be part of an emerging collective of educators who are working towards that space of liberation that keep racial justice and intersectional justice at the forefront. I was about to like start snapping. <laughs> awesome. All right. And uh, last but not least, Julius. Hello, Julius Thomas, professor, counselor, and I work at a community college in LA County. I have been in higher ed now for quite a while. And um, when I decided to apply to be a, a, a cadre trainer, I wasn't sure how many people from higher ed were involved. And I knew that we needed people from higher ed involved. I also knew that this was the next phase in my evolution of um, 
taking on leadership and being committed to making sure that social justice is being taught right. Right. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of a social justice battle. We have been for probably the last 10 years or so. And this is definitely a revolution within social justice. And this is a revolution within social justice work. I know for a fact that CTA is one of the few statewide organizations that offers this type of training uh, statewide. And so I want to make sure I was involved. I want to make sure that I got to have a say in it. Um, I'm having fun and I'm enjoying it. And it's even more amazing when you're listening to what other folks are doing and where other folks are coming from. So greetings. Great, thank you. And again, uh, thank you for sharing your time with us tonight after I'm sure it was a very long work day. <laughs> um, uh, during the pandemic, it seems like every work day is really like five wrapped up into one. Uh, but let's get into the different categories uh, that we offer within the cadre trainings. So we have um, BIPOC leadership advocacy, LGBTQ plus leadership advocacy, racial justice advocacy, women's leadership advocacy, and then transformative social emotional learning. I'm gonna kick it back over to Julius to uh, go over basically the content area in which you train, Julius, which is BIPOC leadership advocacy. Um, tell us more about that, the target audience, et cetera. So in BIPOC leadership, uh, what we're attempting to do is let more people know, especially uh, folks of color, that they too can be involved in leadership in many different ways. There are there are a dozen ways in which you can get involved. Thank goodness there are a dozen ways in which you can come about uh, being a leader. It could be locally, it could be statewide, it could be nationally. Uh, you can be involved in legislation. You can be involved in many avenues. And that's what we're trying to impress upon people. And we're also trying to impress upon people to be involved. You hear a lot of people say, I didn't know, nobody told me, I wasn't aware. Well, you know what? Step up. Step up to the plate. Come be involved. Come get and be come be committed. And all the people that you see on your screen here are committed. They're committed to the leadership that needs to be put forth in order for us to progress forward. And that's what we're doing. We're progressing forward. So with BIPOC leadership, we're letting people know no matter where you are on, on at any status, you can be involved. You can be involved locally. There are programs that are involved. We're expressing to people how various functions work within CTA, within NEA. So we just want to make sure that we have people come and get involved. And it looks like people have tapped out. I don't know if it's my, maybe it's my, uh, let me see. No, okay, everybody's here. Okay, great. Okay, I wasn't sure you guys all disappeared. I went, what the heck happened? Um, I know I'm not saying anything that revolutionary, not yet anyway. Anyway, um, so- you, you just reminded me that I forgot to say at the beginning, there will be technical difficulties and just bear with us. Okay, so anyway, in BIPOC leadership, please come and get involved. Please come and and test your skills. We can use as many people as possible, and we want to put people to work. So that's basically a, a brief uh, orientation. Thank you, Julius. All right, Scott, tell us about your work in your content area. So our LGBTQ plus leadership advocacy is multifaceted. We, we exist in order to help up, uplift our LGBTQ plus members and allies and work with community organizations in order to try to get as much information out to um, members who attend trainings or request trainings. Uh, they may be attending at conferences or maybe specifically need something brought out to, to their sites. Um, the part that is, is very important is through the training, we wanna be able to create safe spaces for both our members and for students. And then how do we keep those places safe so that people can thrive and work in that environment, can learn in those environments, 
um, all with the idea of how to prevent bullying and violence against LGBTQ plus people. So we want to make sure that the 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 workshops are there to um, bring joy to to the people who are attending, so that they can understand um, that working with LGBTQ people is not a bad thing, and we don't need to marginalize the community. Uh, or members of the various communities within the LGBT uh, framework. And we want to see everybody empowered to be the best person they can. So that's basically what we're looking at with this type of advocacy within CTA so that we all have um, equal footing and that we're safe and our voices are heard. Thank you. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Cassie and Vanessa. I didn't know if you wanted to uh, tag team since you were both uh, racial justice. So I'll hand it over to both of you. Would you like to start, Vanessa? You look ready. <laughs> like, like, where are you on the screen? No. Okay. <laughs> so Cassie and I, uh, I have the honor of working with her. She is literally phenomenal mm -hmm. and recharges me every time we get together. Um, in the racial justice advocacy strand, and um, in that strand, we really um, tar we aim to do exactly what we talked about doing in kind of our intros. Um, so we know that we have reached a point in our career where we realize the need for these things in the classroom um, to be taught correctly and shared with students. And we also now aim in our trainings to bring other people to this level with us and uh, we understand that everybody is at varying levels not only in their understanding of what it means to discuss social or racial justice inside of your classroom with us most specifically racial justice um and also within your career and we have broken it up in a way that hopefully when we get out to districts you can ease your way into the work so one thing i think cassie will agree with is that our team is very uh, empathetic to um, just the journey we're all on, right? Uh, we know it's tough, but it's work that needs to be done. So we've developed kind of stages in our training. Uh, one of the first ones that we offer is why systemic racism is not just a buzzword, um, because you get a lot of pushback for it in the community and in other places at large, but really in the classroom and amongst educators, we have to be brutally honest with the fact that it does exist. And unfortunately, it's very prominent in the field that we serve in. Um, so we've broken that down into digestible chunks and we've tried to come up with some activities and resources for people to take back immediately, um, depending on their comfort level and where they are and ready to do the work. Um, and same thing just happened to me that happened to Cassie, technically. I mean, you could tell we're teaching, we're doing this from our classrooms. This is real life here. All right, my lights went off. Uh, and the other one is, uh, <laughs> I don't see color, right? And that one just kind of tries to pull people in to uh, understand why that's actually problematic and dangerous, and then how we can shift beyond that. Um, I'm passing it over to Cassie for other two while I turn my lights on. Absolutely. Yeah, so our, in, in creating these workshops for racial justice advocacy, we're really uh, amplifying the experiences of the global majority. Um, and also we can't forget about intersectionality, um, how that all comes together in the classroom across race, gender, language, sexual orientation, class, ableism, and promoting liberation through collective action. Now that is <laughs> ambitious and that's exactly what we're going for. And we, are offering, um, in addition to creating, uh, you know, why systemic racism is not a buzzword, we're also, uh, we have a session on creating an anti-racist classroom, which is how you decolonize your classroom space, like literally the visual, the language being used, the materials being used, and uh, moving beyond awareness to allyship. How are you uh, increasing your capacity to be an ally and a co-conspirator? And last but not least, using the Western State Center Toolkit on confronting white nationalist ideology and conspiracy theories in the classroom. And that one is uh, based on the Western States Toolkit and that one's bringing up the rise of white nationalism that we have seen in the classrooms, um, we see on the news and how can we bring that into the classroom and actually have uh, tangible action steps. And that's 
also the main goal of all these workshops is can you leave our workshops having unlearned, relearned something, heard counter stories and narratives that catalyze you in moving forward in your work and how can we support you and how can we connect with each other to be part of that emerging collective. I think I think that's really important that um, folks really hear hear that and understand that that you will you will definitely get tangible resources from these trainings, but don't expect that you know hundreds of years of systemic oppression are going to be solved in one training. <laughs> that that uh, we're it's like it's definitely a call to action for you to continue this work for you to continue your your own journey and your own unlearning. I really like uh, Cassie how you named that right uh, your own your unlearning. Um, we have two other categories as well. We have women's women's leadership advocacy, and then also um, transformative uh, social emotional learning. Uh, I want to go back to kind of something like you said, Vanessa. Right? We we get the same thing around catchphrases like with SEL. Right? SEL is the new thing. Uh, what I really like about this section of trainings as well is again, it's member led. These are members developing these. Uh, trainings that are um, authentic, but also relevant. And I think that's really big to to pull out. Uh, of course, the women's advocacy, um, the women's leadership advocacy training really is going to be geared towards uh, not only um, our members who identify as, as female, breaking down barriers, uh, looking at breaking down patriarchy within the systems that we operate in, uh, but also, for um for our, for our members who don't identify as female how do you support that work right and, and how do you check your own privilege within that work and i think that's one thing i like about all of the trainings is it really is anyone can attend them right yes we have target audiences but really it can be for for anyone can attend them it's just whether are you checking your own privilege in that room or are you now looking at how you break down barriers uh, let's get into our next question. I just want to hear so much more from all of you, so I'm like super excited. <laughs> let's get into our next question. Um, and this is going more into uh, the why. So why do you why did you choose the cadre training program as a way to fight for racial and social justice? What I like about this question is uh, there are many different forms of activism. There are many different forms of organizing. So why is it that you chose this lane in order to do that work? And I, folks can just jump in. I'm not going to call on you. Just unmute and jump right in. Unless you, okay, good. I was about to call on somebody. Go for it, Julius. Okay. So um, the reason I chose this is because I had actually heard about the cadre training before, and I I had heard nothing but good uh, things. I had seen some people with their presentations. Actually, I saw Scott's presentation, which I thought was phenomenal. He came to. Uh, the service center and did a presentation that I really was impressed with. I saw some other um, cadre trainers at that time do presentations. I thought, wow, this is pretty cool. And so I went up and I started asking questions. Hey, how did you get involved with this? How does it work? Blah, 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 blah. So then when they put the call out to have more trainings happen and more trainers come in, I said, well, let me go ahead and throw my throw my hat in the ring and let's see what's happening. Um, it's a great way to be, get involved and be involved. It's also a great way to uh, let people know that everybody can participate. So um, I'm having a blast actually. I'm really, really, really enjoying it. And um, you know, you get to meet some good people. I'm, I'm sorry that it's during the COVID era. I know if it wasn't during the COVID era, we'd probably be able to you know, hug and, and, you know, break bread together, but that'll come in time, I'm sure. So. And then I'll jump in there um, for my why. It, it extends past kind of what I mentioned in my intro. I did mention that when I came into the field, I my one of my mentors was ended up being my superintendent. And after attending multiple CTA conferences early on in my career, I was so like happy 
that I found people who were like me. <laughs> like I would love going to these conferences because I could always like talk shop with other educators or other members. And like, it, it was kind of like no filter. We didn't have to worry about like upsetting a fellow colleague or something of that nature. And you just knew you were around like-minded people. And as I progressed through my career, I started to also realize that not everybody was as privileged as I was in working with a superintendent like I do, who welcomes these conversations, who welcomes this type of teaching or this model or this frame of thinking. Um, and I started to think like, wow, this is going to be difficult because it's something I really care about. And I know a lot of educators in general. And so it's like, how do we get this for everyone? And then the cadre program comes along and it's like, CTA who has access and resource and the reach can put us in these places where we can have these conversations with our members um, and give them the things that kind of we've been doing uh, in our rooms or on the back end, like Erica mentions over and over, these are member led. So this isn't like a consulting group or this isn't somebody who's paid to push a certain initiative. This is like real tried and true practices that we've all done in our classrooms we've seen it work, we bring it to the table as a team, we flush it out and we make it fluid. And like I mentioned before, that allows for us to give the members resources that are gonna meet multiple levels of entry points, right? Because we know we could in the room have somebody who's been waiting for this day to meet people who are going to actually allow them to do the work. And then we have people who are like, wait a minute, I didn't hear about this in my credential program, right? So it's a nice landing and then it's cool that we have a team, right? Like we're in these facets where we get to work with other people. And I know Cassie and Christina and Frank and the people on our team, we're from all over the state. So that's awesome too. Like our first 15, 20 minutes is always like, what's going on in your area? Like, and we get to like hear things and like chat, but we're always, it's always on topic because it's always about something racially or socially charged. Um, but it's cool. We get to collab and then we get to flush it out. We get to support. And then at the end of the day, everything that we're doing here in the program directly impacts students who are the next generation and it's going to come back. We'll reap the benefits of it one day, hopefully. Well, I will go now if that's all right with Cassie. <laughs> so I'm not sure several years ago that, that when we were out training that that racial and social justice was on the forefront of everybody's minds. I think it was, oh, we, we, we're going to educate our members, which is at least for the LGBT part, that was something that was needed and that's how it was looked at. But thank goodness that all of our um, issues all overlap in some form um, and intersect so that if, if we're talking about something that benefits an LGBTQ student, well, it certainly affects women and people of color and everybody. And so the one thing that I think we've learned um, over time is that the LGBTQ plus community hasn't been always inclusive of people of color, and that is changing, at least within our organization it is, um, where our workshops, make a point to, to include that intersection between everybody. Um, we know that LGBTQ plus people of color, children of color that eventually are in work in the workplace are discriminated more against everybody else. Um, it wasn't until just a few years ago that fighting for racial and social justice, um, I'm going to say became a thing, but it was always there. It just wasn't seen. And we didn't know who else was fighting the same fight. So now we're all starting to get together and we're realizing that it's, wow, okay, it might look a little bit different, but it's, we're still fighting. So um, I'm very proud of that history within the California Teachers Association for being at the point where we are now in 2022, um, even though we're not doing things the way we used to do them. Uh, by being in person and all of that. But I remember when I started, people said, oh, you're such an advocate. I'm like, I had no, I had no idea what that word meant. And I don't know that I mean, know what it means today either. I just know because I'm part of that community of the LGBTQ plus community. And I see what people do to children all the time. And that has to stop. So if it's 
if 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 there's something wrong, we stand up and we say it, and we shouldn't be afraid of it anymore. Because now we're we're growing and we're building and we're we're making sure that everyone knows to call it out, what whatever the issue is, that we're empowered because we have people that are standing behind us and standing beside us. So we are now becoming that social justice, uh, racial and social justice network for our members who are thirsty for get it, for this information because they're not getting it where they work and like i said at the beginning they know what's right what's right what's wrong but they've never found their support group and i'm hoping that uh, as the cadre gro goes on for uh, many years to come that that is something that's woven into having that support network for everyone who's attended and um, there are plans for that so that's a good thing but i'm just very proud of how our organization has has really taken this um, full steam ahead to make sure that we can um, make a difference because our kids are depending on us. It's God, that's a hard one to follow up. All right. <laughs> but yeah, I, um, I chose the cadre program, a uh, training program, because um, I too was uh, a teacher trying to find allies and co-conspirators and I would go to the um, human rights uh, conference and that's where I felt the most challenged, where I did the most unlearning, where I had the most support, where I found I was previous cadre trainers would give me contacts of people that I could communicate with to bring these resources and these trainings to my site. And that's being in a very small rural school of only like 160 students with only like 40 educators. I was like, if this can't happen in a community that I grew up in with teachers that are my colleagues that were my teachers in it, like that, those personal relationships are really rare. I'm like if I can't do it in my own hometown, like when I'm, so I was trying to walk the talk. And so when, um, when this came up, it, I'm really searching for one of the greatest questions is like, how do we fight for liberation within uh, the very system that was created by white supremacy? <laughs> and what what does that look like? What are what are the answers? That's and that's really changed um, uh, over the years. It's like, how do we create a, a school space that's even that serves all students is that even possible so forever in search of the question and i had to start becoming really humbled um that it wasn't gonna be me because i feel like that's some white supremacy toxicity is like you're very into you're told to be like on your own independent you can do it all i'm like no so it have gone way past that through the fragility the guilt the rage and finally got to I need to be part of a collective and of a collective and contribute a grain of sand and then hopefully I can be of use at this point in time. So I'm now just searching for that emerging collective and I definitely found it in here with the rest of the cadre trainers and that's where I'm consistently challenged where I get the contacts I need, where I get the support that I need, where I can actually make friends across my difference in the skin that I'm in because I'm actually unlearning. I'm very comfortable about being uncomfortable because that's forever and i have 33 years of being socialized in a white dominated space and it's going to take me another 33 years to unlearn that so perpetually on the journey and i'm just so honored and fortunate to be here i one um again each of you like had mic drop moments i wish like <laughs> we, we should have gotten everyone in the audience to like show some emojis and things like that. Uh, but one of the things I, I definitely want to pull out of there is the fact that this cadre, the whole program and the fact that, you know, the trainers are working together even across, um, you know, the, their curricular areas, uh, really pulling out that intersectional lens, realizing that, you know, all of us have a little piece. I really like that sand analogy, right? Like all of us have this little piece in this work, but also it's not stagnant, right? Like are the trainings are the trainings morph and you're constantly in these conversations and, and updating them and talking through them. And, um, you know, I would definitely say if you went to the same title training 
it would be different each time you attend it, right? Based on, you know, who's in the room, uh, the convert, how the conversation flows. And really looking at it, I think one of the amazing things about all of you just as cadre trainers, and I know, and I know the title, I guess, is cadre trainer, but really you're facilitating. It's not, it's not a lecture. You're not coming into a space just to get talked at for an hour. You, it really is a facilitating dialogue. Um, and you as a member that is attending these trainings, you have those really big moments where you're like, oh, I just unlearned something. <laughs> or, oh, that I, I didn't know. You know, I, I know I've, I've been in um, a lot of uh, trainings with a lot of you where I've seen members like, oh, I came in with this impression of even what liberation meant, right? Like I came in with this impression or I came in thinking that this meant this and I'm now I, I'm back to square one and that's a good thing, right? And that's a good thing. So I just really appreciate that. I wanted to uplift all of your work um, and, and just the fact that, you know, you're you're doing this, you're doing this basically to help all of us be better. Um, and I think that's pretty amazing. So let's let's think about that. Let's think about what has been rewarding and what has been challenging uh, as far as part of this. And I, and I do have to, I'm just gonna name it, the pandemic has definitely been a challenge because uh, we've basically put this program together during, during the pandemic. We have trainers who have trained who haven't even met in person in real life that are training virtually together and have built these relationships. So I, I'm gonna name the pandemic. So uh, that's definitely been a challenge, but other folks wanna chime in on what's what's been rewarding and what's been challenging. I'll go ahead and jump in if no one else wants to go first. For me, what's been rewarding, it took a while to get to that point, um, but to have members come back and say, I went and fixed this. I went and pushed on this person and the policy has changed. Or my students who were being bullied are now thriving. That has got to be the most rewarding part of working with our members because they truly are looking for a way to make change at their own site. And, um, you know, a lot of times I say, I don't know that I've ever made a difference in anybody's life. And then every once in a while, there will be someone who comes in and says the most amazing thing. And I think how, how I'm glad because I, I wasn't sure that you were even listening or, um, but then realizing that what they were doing was they were processing of how they were going to go back and fix something. And that is, that's a rewarding part. And I tell people while I'm training, my goal is really to create little monsters when I leave because I may not be there for them um, on a Monday and um, go back and, you know, if you need support, here's my number. But, um, you know, even, even just working within within the other parts of the organization on on our issues, which are all of them. I mean, we're all trying to contribute something and that, that is so important. What's been difficult? Well, I think Erica mentioned it. It was this dumb pandemic that we're in. It's not dumb that way, but um, I just, it's been difficult, but yet the need is still there and people are showing up and people are there and they're, they're doing it. So it's hard not to be in that physical room um, especially when someone is, uh, if something, if, if a member is triggered and they start crying, it's hard to give a hug through a video screen, uh, which in person that happens quite often, that people will have some type of breakthrough in their own life and um, they'll stay with you for an hour after the workshop just talking. And that that is um, something that you know, we've been very good in education the last few years and taking the human part out of education. We, I think the pandemic though has taught us that we need to be human again um, and we need to make changes. And uh, what that looks like is gonna be different with wherever we're at, but we do need to have that human contact because we're wired that way. So it's been a good and a bad thing, but um, our, our membership number, our, our presentation numbers are higher that means that still things are going on. And especially with the students, um, 
many of our students are home with their abusers in, the, in all of our areas. So we want to make sure that we're, we're doing the best that we could during that time and still educating members. So um, that's it for me. Yeah, if it's okay, I would, I can go next. The, um, yeah, I would say the most challenging is within this pandemic has been just the, uh, there's positives and negatives to the concept of time. And I'm trying to follow that quote by Adrian Marie Brown that like time is fluid and it's like water and I'm still like, what? Like just pandemic made it seem like all of our work hours were, it almost is like you had transitions. And I think that's been the most challenging has been um, my workspace triggers my flow into what I'm doing. So here I'm in my classroom, here's my flow. In my car, decompressing on the way home, home set in relaxation but now it just seems like the whole day because you can access anybody via zoom or on platforms that your whole day is almost opened up more on a positive that that is the only way as the positive side has been how we can connect and collaborate and catalyze each other when we need each other most so that's like the positive aspect of it but the negative is um the negative almost is just, I don't know what to turn that off. So that's been my management of time, definitely the most challenging, but um, it's also been the most rewarding. Um, for the students uh, being in the classroom, it's the, it's only through the work, through this, cadre uh, through this cadre training and through all the work prior that's collected into who I am now, um, that I've been able to uh, respond and push for uh, human kind empathetic responses at my school site. Um, and just as Scott said, the uh, intersection of bullying, being at home with parents that are divorcing or going through domestic violence, all that is coming into the classroom space. And through these trainings and conversations, I've been uh, stronger and better equipped to respond efficiently and empathetically. Um, I think for me, the challenging part has definitely been COVID. Prior to COVID, I had never done hardly anything in terms of training virtually. Um, so it was a rush, rush. You have to catch up to your skills. You have to catch up to understand how various functions work of WebEx and Zoom. And then you have to get used to seeing a screen and being on a screen and how to conduct yourself on a screen and and I'm also teaching as well teaching a class as well so COVID has definitely been challenging um the thing I think that's rewarding is there is a intrinsic feeling that happens just when you present your your training I and I had that feeling this past weekend um we, we did, uh, the, the two colleagues I work with, we did our presentation for issues. And there was just a beautiful feeling that happened intrinsically because we, we could tell that the audience we were working with, they got it. They understood. Uh, it was clear. They gave us feedback. Um, people stayed in the training. And... Uh, you know, there's that feeling is is something that you just, you know, it outweighs a lot of things in terms of you knowing that, hey, I was able to work with my colleagues and uh, give up something that that can be passed along. So. And I will say um, the challenges of the program or just challenges faced in the program um definitely i is the virtual it touches on a lot of what um julia said and cassie more so cassie because i think it's with a team like in something like this it is really important that we collaborate on some of the things that we're creating because um again a lot of this is about lived experience and we all bring different perspectives to the work that we're doing but like she mentioned you know we're at work we have that time and then there's the drive and then there's the virtual. And so it seems at times things can just happen, but then we forget we're living in like a dual reality, like virtual and real. And so those things can be um, demanding at times, but um, I think that it shows 
amongst us that we're really invested in this because we've made it work. Uh, and I think it's because of one of the things that I think is the most rewarding about the program. It's that we get to be like our whole selves in this program and the way I would describe it. Um, and not even just in the things that we're passionate about and that we chose in our, our stand, but that we can fluidly join another one. So like my first training at LGBTQ plus was with the women's um, section with Sharkita and we had never met in real life until right before and the vibe was like there and it was just so much fun like it, it reminded me what it's like you know to go to these conferences whether i am a presenter or i'm in the audience regardless it's fun like we're learning we're being honest we're being truthful it, there's trust-based vulnerability in the room right we're all educators we're all facing the same stuff and I think we forgot that that's something that we can lean on with each other. And so the program in, in going to our meetings and our trainer meetings and our sessions, we haven't done much trainings because of COVID, but it's brought back like that sense of like community and joy and family that CTA offers. Um, and so I am like bummed when we're seeing camp, you know, them go back virtual. Cause I'm like, no, I needed you guys to feel this. Trust me. It's still there. Right. It's still there. I promise. I went to one, um, but <laughs> I know it'll come back and it just is helping keep the work alive for me. Like being a part of the program is keeping me afloat in like just my drive and my motivation of like, we'll get there. It's still worth it. We can still do this. You still have people in your corner. You still have, you know, like minds, they're still there. And so I'm glad and I hope that we can remind the members too through this program that like, we're still here, lean on us, use us, contact us, Instagram us, email us, like things like that. So I think um, we are like another branch to reminding that you have a community here. Oh, that's so awesome. Um, so uh, yes, like all of that, all the feels. Um, one thing, I, so let's do some little audience participation. So those of you in the audience who are who are watching, uh, if you can go ahead and type in the chat, uh, maybe topics that you would like to see Kadri, um, the Kadri group address in the future, uh, or also if you have if you have any questions. Uh, like one last question maybe, but go ahead and utilize the chat. Tell us what topics you would like to see or you're interested in um, as far as uh, something else that we could add under the cadre umbrella. But here's my here's my last question. So this is my final question. Uh, how has your, uh, all of you are in the call, all of you are teaching. How has your teaching changed since you've become a cadre trainer? I can go first. Um, I think just thinking back in these last couple months, what's on my mind when I'm doing what I usually do, um, I think it's the intersectionality piece. Being a part of the Cadre program has reminded me so much more of um, things that we're talking about constantly and how those intersect with either gender or gender roles and identity and race. Um, it's easy to get harped on like a topic and one social issue and like really drive that home. But to really get our kids to understand, I think, is to pull in how it affects everybody or how it's um, like a, a multi-layered issue, right? Um, I think that helps my students find ways and avenues, like entry points into this work as well. So that has been huge for me. Um, I know when I started the program, I was like, one thing I want to get better at this year and through this program, hopefully, is my um, advocacy for and allyship with the LGBTQ plus community. And I think that this year being a part of the Cadre program and just listening in and going to sessions and even without presenting, right, racial justice advocacy wasn't at LGBTQ plus, but going and presenting there, um, has like propelled me into another world and it's super helpful in the classroom as a teacher who's already passionate about one branch of this to be well versed in all of it because our students are so multifaceted so i appreciate that the program is so rich and like robust in the things that it offers and again the one that sharkita and i did was like how which groups are 
like historically left out of women movements. So like the training in and of itself was intersectional. And I felt like I had something to contribute to that. I was like, well, I know this because black women like and or black women who identify as black women were like shunned out. And we just like we're going on these tangents. And I'm like, this is what it feels like for our kids to feel like they're not being seen on a topic that is being made sound really important. So we have to constantly keep that intersectionality lens on. And um, I think in my opinion, just strive to be your best at it as well so that you give other people the space in the room to be, you know, their, their authentic full selves. Yeah, anyone else wanna jump in? Erica, repeat repeat the question again, please. Sure. How now that you've been a cadre trainer, how has that actually changed the way you teach or the way you educate? So I I have um, because I'm I'm fortunate to teach adults. I have uh, run some of the stuff that I'm doing past my adult students to see exactly what they think and where their opinions are on various things and issues. And uh, I've gotten a great deal of positive feedback in terms of uh, what I'm presenting and, and what's going forward. Um, I dare say that I think CTA is on the cusp of doing something revolutionary in terms that other states will want to pick up the vibe of where we're going with this and how we're going about it um, with members being the ones that are doing the training and um, I, it's, it's increased everything. I, like I said, I wasn't doing hardly any type of virtual training before this. Um, I had done a couple of classes before and uh, now it's made me very comfortable and um, I'm, I'm having a good time with it. For me, it's made teaching far more intentional and uh, making sure the kids are there first and and also seeing where all the inadequacies are in our curriculum and adding that part that the parts that need to be added in that were omitted uh, during the textbook writing and adoption process. So making sure that, um, I mean, and that's not just an LGBTQ plus thing. That's everybody. That's just that's that's just putting. There's one thing my students when I moved up to fifth grade that every year my students will say at the end of the year, we know you had our back the entire year, because fifth graders, as I'm sure um, Vanessa knows, they're blamed for everything. Whether or not it happened four counties over, the fifth graders are blamed because of their age. Well. To be able to stand up and advocate for them or 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 give them this help them with the skills to advocate for themselves has been even better um, but it's far more intentional and and being present watching everything else that's going on it has been a phenomenal change um you know a lot of times people say union work you know makes you you know pulls you out of the classroom whatever i think it actually helps our teaching uh, because we do see a bigger picture out there. I would say the, I have a lot of opinions about how I've changed, but the ones that truly tell me if something is different is the actions of the students or their interactions with me as the true evidence, right? Because I'm most accountable to serving students. So when the students come up to me and they're like, Cassie, you need to repeat, um, uh, you, you need a reminder of the things that we can and can't say at school or some of your colleagues are, they don't say colleagues, but like these other teachers are um, forgetting students' pronouns. But the fact that they're coming to me as a trustworthy source to then go up through admin and say, well, we're revamping this training, this is not okay. Um, that's the biggest indicator is when students know that they can come up to me and I will do something about it or talk about dress code and then we that's been the most recent one is the the mid drift and the white girls are not being sent to the office but our um our latino women are um and then going through and revamping that policy and all of that that's 
the biggest indicator for me of that my teaching is different is because uh, they're coming up to me and asking me and then uh, in turn, we are both together coming to the table to make those changes at our school site. So I, I really want to, I really want to pull that out that I, I think, I think anytime we're talking about racial and social justice, the fact that we can then look at our policies and procedures on our campuses and see, you know, in real time, here is an example of where this change needs to happen. And then through our union work, actually have the support to make the change happen, to make the change happen. I think that's so important. I also want to name what Scott said about being intentional. I, that's so huge. I, I see, and, and what I've seen um, just in the little time I've been around all of you amazing cadre trainers, I have definitely seen like an intentionality. Um, now it's going to rhyme, an intentionality around intersectionality. <laughs> Um, you know, where 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 you're taking it on and and really I I agree. I think it I think it's also probably what's helped all of us get through the pandemic is is being more intentional about not only our our work under the racial and social justice umbrella, but also just within our you know normal day to day within our professions. Uh, so with that, I, I want to ask, does anyone have some last words they want to say. We have about one minute before we wrap up and we're going to be right on time at five. Any any last thoughts folks want to share? Look us. No. <laughs> there you go. Uh, for information on how, to, you know what, that's a great, that's a great plug, Vanessa. Thank you. Um, if if you want to figure out how to get uh, cadre trainers uh, within your local, uh, the links have been put in the chat. It's also, again, uh, cta.org forward slash cadre has a bunch of information, including flyers you can download. Um, and with that, we can call it a night. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully we will uh, be able to build community more.